Hello, B here, and welcome back to biology. Today, we're delving into our first lesson on biological diversity, and we're starting with some of the smallest, simplest living things around. Bacteria. Bacteria cells are too small to see, so we have to use a microscope. However, you can see large colonies of bacteria cells. They show up as the white dots on the agar plate here. How many cells do you think make up the white dots on these plates? Each one consists of thousands of bacteria cells. To study bacteria, scientists grow them on plates of agar, which is a jelly-like substance full of nutrients to help the bacteria grow. As we go through the lesson today, we'll look at some different examples of bacterial species and answer an important question. Are bacteria friends or foes? What do you think? Pause the video and record a few ideas in your lesson notes. Before we get started, let's look at our goals for this lesson. By the end, you'll be able to explain basic characteristics and classifications of bacteria, describe bacterial processes including metabolism, movement, and reproduction, and give examples of ways in which bacteria species both help and harm humans. Remember that life is grouped into three domains. Today we are focusing on the bacteria domain, which has one kingdom, also called bacteria. Within the bacteria kingdom, there is debate among scientists about how many phyla they should be divided into. Some feel that they can be accurately divided into nine phyla. Others would rather see as many as 50 or more phyla of bacteria added. One of the easiest ways to classify bacteria is by their shape. When seen under a microscope, most bacteria appear as either spheres, rods, or spirals. Spherical or round bacteria are known as cocci. Rods are called bacilli, and spirals are referred to as spirillum. Could you classify these three bacterial species by shape? Let's start with Escherichia coli. It has a long, skinny shape. So it is a rod or bacillus bacteria. Staphylococcus aureus gives us a hint right in the name, if the shape wasn't obvious already. It's a round or coccus bacteria. Campylobacter looks like a tiny wiggly worm, so it's a spiral bacteria or spirillum bacteria. Another way that bacteria are often classified is by color except that most bacteria in their natural state would be white or clear, not helpful for classification. But a common procedure is to stain the bacteria cells with a series of dyes and see which dye sticks. This process is called Gram staining after Hans Christian Gram, who first performed it in 1884. Bacteria cells have at least some peptidoglycan in their cell walls. Peptidoglycan is a large sugar molecule with amino acids embedded in it. Cells with a thick layer of peptidoglycan, such as this one, absorb the purple dye from gram staining very well and look purple under the microscope. These are called gram-positive bacteria. Other types of bacteria only have a thin layer of peptidoglycan in the cell wall. As a result, the purple gram stain washes off but a later stain that is applied causes them to appear pink under the microscope. These are known as gram-negative bacteria. Many of the harmful bacteria that cause disease, such as Staphylococcus and Streptococcus, are gram-positive. Fortunately for us, the physical property of their cell walls, which causes them to absorb the purple dye, also causes them to absorb antibiotics well. So, most of these little invaders are relatively easy to kill with the right medicine. The cell walls of gram-negative bacteria do not absorb antibiotics well, making them much more difficult to kill. 
Diseases caused by gram-negative bacteria, such as pneumonia and meningitis, are therefore much more difficult to cure. Most bacteria are heterotrophs, meaning they must consume organic molecules made by other living things. This agrobacterium grows on plants, causing tumors to form on the plant stalks, and giving the bacteria cells access to the plant's nutrients for their own needs. A bacteria you may be more familiar with is Salmonella, which can cause severe intestinal discomfort as well as fever when we eat food that is contaminated with it. Being heterotrophs, Salmonella bacteria live off the nutrients inside their host. When you are the host, it's not fun. However, there are some species of bacteria, such as this nostoc, that are autotrophs, meaning they can make their own food by doing photosynthesis. Often called cyanobacteria, these prokaryotic cells help fill the atmosphere with oxygen and are very similar to the bacteria which produced the first oxygen in Earth's atmosphere during the Precambrian era. Can bacteria move on their own? Well, some can, but not all. Species such as E. coli and Streptococcus are immobile, so they can only go where they are carried by a host or by the elements such as wind and water. Other bacteria have a tail-like flagella that can propel them through fluid substances, similar to the way a fish swims through water. An even more interesting adaptation by some bacteria, such as Mycococcus, is the ability to secrete a slimy substance and then glide over it with a snake-like motion. Bacteria are known for their ability to multiply. A single bacteria cell can sometimes grow to a colony of thousands of cells in a matter of hours. Bacteria reproduce by a process called binary fission. Binary fission is very similar to mitosis in that it simply makes identical copies of cells. This is known as asexual reproduction, as there is no need for two parents. One cell simply makes a copy of itself. But if bacteria only reproduce by making exact copies of themselves, how is variation ever introduced into bacterial populations? We know that variation is crucial to the long-term survival of a species. Bacteria can achieve variation in two ways. The first you already know about, mutations. Because they reproduce and make new generations so quickly, mutations can arise and spread through a population in a matter of days. Many bacteria have another strategy as well, though. That is an adaptation specifically allowing for the introduction of new traits. Bacteria cells can undergo conjugation. A tube-like structure called a pilus connects two cells, allowing for DNA to be transferred between them. Will the DNA received by the bacteria be helpful or harmful? They have no way of knowing, but introducing some variety into their DNA is obviously worth the gamble to them. In favorable conditions, bacteria can grow and multiply quickly. But what happens when conditions are more hostile or there is not enough food available? Many bacteria can form spores. They enclose themselves in a thick wall and go dormant for months or even years. When conditions improve, the wall breaks down and the bacteria can pick up right where they left off. The ability of bacteria such as anthrax to remain in this state has caused concern, as it could be transferred long distances and used as an agent of warfare once it reaches its target. At the beginning of the lesson, I asked you to consider whether bacteria are more friend or foe. What do you think so far? Let's take a look at a few more examples before we decide for sure. This small bug has died, but there's still plenty of activity going on under the microscope. When organisms die, the nutrients and organic molecules that make up their body must be broken down and returned to the ecosystem. Bacteria are largely responsible for this job. 
If this didn't happen, the world would quickly run out of building blocks, and all heterotrophic organisms would starve to death. Organisms that break down dead organic matter and recycle the nutrients are known as decomposers. Most decomposers are either fungi, worms, or bacteria. It's a gritty, thankless job, but we're sure glad they do it. Another important job held by bacteria is to process nitrogen. Remember that nitrogen is an important ingredient needed to make protein. And it would seem fortunate that our atmosphere is made of nearly 80% nitrogen. Unfortunately, that nitrogen is in the form of N2. Our body can't use N2 to make protein. In fact, most living things can't do much with N2. We need more complex forms of nitrogen-based compounds, such as NH3, ammonia. Lucky for us and the rest of life on Earth, there exists a type of bacteria that turns the simple N2 molecules from the atmosphere into complex molecules like ammonia. We typically find these nitrogen-fixing bacteria on the roots of plants in structures called nodules. Once again, bacteria saves the day. We even have many forms of helpful bacteria living inside us right now. If you had lunch already, or maybe breakfast, that food is currently being digested by your body with the help of millions of E. coli bacteria cells. But bacteria don't always play the role of hero. You are probably very aware that bacteria can also do great harm to living things and make us quite ill. Even the E. coli in our digestive tract can cause problems if cells with certain mutations are introduced through contaminated food. Bacteria that cause diseases are known as pathogens. The illness itself is usually caused by toxins that are secreted by the bacterial cells as waste products. Clostridium tetani, which causes tetanus, can disrupt nerve function in our bodies. Mycobacterium tuberculosis causes its namesake disease, often just called TB, which can be a severe lung infection. You can probably guess what unpleasant illness is caused by streptococcus, strep throat. Actually, Streptococcus is a large genus of bacteria, and various species within this genus cause a number of dangerous diseases, including scarlet fever and toxic shock syndrome. So, it looks like the only reasonable conclusion is that bacteria are both. They can certainly be our friend at times, but they quickly become foes when they make us sick and endanger our health. As we went through the lesson today, we saw examples of organisms in the bacteria kingdom. We learned that bacteria can be classified by shape and color with some help from staining. We saw how bacteria cells metabolize, move, and reproduce. And we looked at examples of bacteria that are helpful and others that are harmful. In the lesson PDF, you'll have a chance to practice classifying bacteria and take a closer look at how antibiotics work to kill harmful bacteria. Next time, we'll explore the other prokaryotic domain, archaea. Until then, remember that biology isn't just science, it's the way of life. Hey, hey.